This is Recovery Lifestyles with Carmel. Recovery Lifestyles is committed to raising awareness and ending stigmas surrounding addiction and mental health. On today's show, I'm going to be chatting with a longtime friend from early recovery named Katie. So Katie is the mother of two amazing children, ages 12 and 13. She's a wife and co-owner of two successful businesses. She's also an educational assistant by day and fitness instructor by night. Katie is an advocate for mental health, addiction, and eating disorders. Having been in recovery since 2005, her passion lies in helping others overcome obstacles that are holding them back from living the life that they deserve. Katie believes each and every day is a gift, and she pushes to continuously better herself and those around her. Hey, how's it going? Good, Carmel. How are you? I'm good. So I'm super excited to have you here today because we know each other from, I mean, the beginning of this recovery journey, long, long time ago. And I know that you have a wealth of information and you're inspiring. So thank you again for being here. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It means a lot. Yeah. So how, how many years are you sober now? Uh, I got sober May 6th, 2005. Wow. So it's 14 years. That's amazing. That's a long time. So who were you back then? I was, <laughs> well, my, my family likes to call it, uh, it was my time on Mars. Oh. It's <laughs> saying that that was my crazy time. And uh, back then it was, I was just a shell of who I was. I was, uh, I was scared and I was lonely and um, I just lived in my own little world and it was painful. Yeah. So, and I know your drug of choice was similar to mine because of where we, ch- where, where we met up in CA. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's got to be 17, probably 17 years ago now. I mean, I'm just, like, I started going to meetings about 17 years ago. And I just, yeah. I remember you, someone there in the beginning when I first, you know, I relapsed a few times. And when I started to get it, uh, you were somebody that was always there. So. Yeah, I first came in probably about 15 and a half or so years ago. Um, And then I did the same thing. I relapsed and I remember coming in and I remember seeing you. I remember seeing you in the basement and I remember thinking like, oh my God, this girl is so young and she has her shit together. I thought, oh my gosh, you're like, (laughs) you were a God to me back then because I feel like at that time when you had just over a year, I think when I came in, I thought that that was, was like unachievable. I didn't think that I would ever get to that point. And now I look back and think, wow, we were just so new. We were just babies in recovery still. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, at a year sober, I don't even think I knew who I was yet. I I still, I did not have it together, but I understand your perspective, right? And for that newcomer that's coming in, it is a big deal to see other women sitting there and young. Because who, mm-hmm. wants to, who wants to really stop having fun when they're in their early 20s? At least we thought, it, we, thought we were having fun, right? <laughs> yeah. Yes. That was the big persona that we were having fun. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me, what was that um, decision for you, that painful decision for you to come into the 12-step program? Um, well, I had come in one other time uh, at about 15 and a half years ago or so. I came in. And it was kind of a forced thing. It was, um, I was really heavy into the drugs and big time drinking. Um, Most of my friends didn't even want to be around me anymore because every time I was around, it was just a disaster. And uh, there was one night in particular and um, there was cops involved and I was arrested and, and it was messy. It was very, very messy. And um, basically the next day after being well, spent the night in a, in a padded room, the next day, the cops basically gave me the option of you either need to change your life or um, we're going to charge you. And so I was like, no, I'm going to change. I'm, I'm going to do better. And so I went in, I found some 12 step meetings and I went and, and I just played the card. It wasn't real. I wasn't actually ready to change. And as soon as, um, it seemed as though I had my feet under myself, um, I relapsed and I relapsed hard. 
and I spent another six to 10 months, I can't even remember, um, basically in a basement suite, just killing myself. Mm. And eventually it just came to the point where there was an intervention with my family and they basically said, like, you need to do something or you're going to die and we can't watch you do that anymore. And so I knew, I knew what to do because I had been in recovery for those few months. And so I found my big book and I opened it up and I had one phone number that I had saved and I called that person and they met me at a meeting and uh, the rest is 14 years now. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. So you have a 13 year old daughter, you're a mom in recovery. And how does that make you feel today? Because I mean, I started drinking and experimenting with drugs at 13. So how is that for you? <laughs> it terrifies me. It absolutely yeah. terrifies me. Um, on one hand, I would never change what I went through. Um, and on the other hand, I don't want to see her have to go through it. Um, so I try to think about what can I do differently that my parents did or didn't do that could change the tides. And ultimately, um, I don't know the answer. I don't know the answer. I feel like I was born with a bit of an emptiness inside that always need to be filled. Mm. And maybe it's genetics. Maybe it's, um, there was some child sexual assault that went on. Um, I was very little and my parents were so supportive and they did everything they could and they followed all the steps they thought were right. Um, and they were basically told that I was really little and I was just going to forget about it anyway. Oh my goodness. So, um, it was it that, was that the catalyst to the events that happened? I, I don't, I don't really know. What I do know is that, um, there was just that hole inside me and I just tried to fill it my whole life, my whole life. Even today, I have to really watch my unhealthy behaviors and filling that void forever. I feel like that's going to be a forever thing. I hear you. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes it can feel a little bit exhausting, right? It is so exhausting. I know. It's like, I thought I healed this already. Yeah. <laughs> Why is this happening again? Mm -hmm. I'm just thankful for the tools that I learned along the way um, mm -hmm. so that I can catch it before it gets too bad and before I hit those super unhealthy behaviors that I don't know if there is a way back out if yeah. I go too far. And so it's that risk versus reward of, um, you know, I can dabble in unhealthy behaviors, but how far before the point of no return? And so I catch myself and I ask for help or I wrap myself out. Yeah, that's a really hard place for most addicts to be in. Even in recovery, I find myself, you know, struggling to reach out. I, I, would per, I would rather isolate in my pain than reach out. And that's been a really hard cycle to break. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because there's that half of me that wants to just think that I can handle it on my own and that I can fix it. And then there's that other half of me that finds comfort in that yeah. little bit of sick. And I don't even like to admit that out loud, but it's the truth. And that's what, that's what saves me, I think, is that I'm honest with the fact that, you know what, there's that piece of me that still likes that weird, crazy solitude of isolation and, and sadness. Yeah, I mean, it is. That's what I was just going to say, is that it can be comforting. So for somebody who is listening that may be struggling right now in that space, what would you want to say to them that about, about what we're talking about, isolation and keeping it to yourself? Because I think that there's an underlining, underlying um, current of shame. For sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, I, basically, I would say that it's only comforting for so long. And it's such a slippery slope that if I feel as though I'm handling it, it's not really far down the road before it's handling me instead of me handling it. And I don't 
ever want to be in the place that it is like fighting tooth and nail to get back out of it. And so it's better to ask for help before it gets too bad. Even if, even if someone feels like, Oh, it's not that bad. And I'm not as bad as this person or she's worse than me or he's worse than me. There's no, there's no such thing in my world anymore that if we have that emptiness inside and I feel as though things are getting bad, then that's bad enough. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, make sense? <laughs> oh no, that was really good. <laughs> Um, I think it's really hard to recognize and that's what I feel like longer term sobriety does bring to us is that awareness and able to recognize when we're in those behaviors. But again, you know, somebody who is just starting to get sober, um, you know, what do you think the, the feelings are or the habits? What would, what would they want to be watching out for? I would say, um, any kind of reoccurring pattern that, that they may be used to go through, whether it's the not answering the phone. I know that's one that I need to watch <laughs> for, that that's yeah. a reoccurring pattern for me is that if I'm reaching out and I'm talking to people and I'm making Facebook posts and I'm you know, <laughs> doing all those things, then all of a sudden I go through a month where I'm ignoring the phone when it rings or I'm not making the posts that I used to make. Um, then that's something for me to recognize is, is an unhealthy pattern and I'm starting to isolate. I feel as though isolation is one of the very first catalysts to things like addiction and such. Yeah, I mean, because we feel safe when we're by ourselves, right? Nobody can hurt us, nobody can shame us. I know that for myself, I have always and still do catch myself in the patterns of struggling with, am I good enough? Am I good enough? Right. If I share this with you, are you going to think badly of me? And mm-hmm. whew, that's a big one. Do you have anything to share on that one? Oh, that is like, that's like my life in a nutshell right there. Um, I, uh, I work in an elementary school oh. and so I have this like pendulum swing of, um, I should talk about my experience, strength and hope so that I, people who are struggling can reach out to me or I can reach out to them. And then on the other end of the spectrum, I'm like, I don't want them to know who I used to be because what if they judge me for it? What if they're, what if they decide they don't want their child with an addict alcoholic? Um, And so, so there's definitely, I I go through that a lot. Same with um, business wise in the business that we have, there's a lot of kids And there's a lot of adults and ultimately I've come to the conclusion that if they judge me, that's not up to me to take on. No. And I know in this cycle that we're talking about, I have found that a lot of times that the people who are judging me are in denial about what they're doing. So they have, they need to judge me. hundred percent. Yeah. 100%. And if they're not ready to look at, their side of the street and, and they're not ready for change, then at least maybe they have that tidbit of information about me that mm-hmm. when they are ready, I'm still going to be here. I'm not going anywhere and I'm not changing. I won't change who I am. And so if they ever decide that they need help or they want help, then I'm still here. Yeah. Isn't it funny that we do that to ourselves? <laughs> like, mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, I know that you probably feel the same way, but when I see you in the life that you lead today and you're so successful in everything you do and um, you, you're such an amazing mom and have this beautiful life, I mean, nobody would ever imagine that's where you came from. And mm-hmm. I know I have that experience as well. So Wow. I, I feel like the power is in telling our stories and sharing, but holy smokes, that is hard sometimes. It Definitely is. Definitely a journey. I've been thinking lots lately about the fact that I've been a little quieter about my story lately, probably the past three to four years. It's been busy building business and, and the kids, and I love being a mom, and, yeah. and I've put myself on the back burner, and I feel as though come to a place where I'm like, why would people want to hear my story? 
And my dad, who's a brilliant, amazing man, he always, he has this saying that he says to the kids all the time. And he's like, why not? Oh, that's good. It doesn't matter about why, it's why not. And I don't have anything to lose. And I know that I only have um, more to gain than I already have. And I know that my story and the things that I've been through and what I've overcome can be something. It is. And it's it's useful. I, I feel that, you know, I've talked about this a lot on here is that social media is now offering this whole new platform that we didn't have when you and I got mm -hmm. sober in the beginning. And can you imagine what, I don't know, I just feel like I, I'm grateful that there was no social media because, wow, I do not need that being shown everywhere. No. <laughs> I would be horrified to go find myself on the internet from those days. Um, Can you imagine? Right? But at, the same time, <laughs> but at the same time, it's like there's so many tools now and everybody's talking about it. And so that, that shame piece that we carry is just starting to dissolve because, again, there's power in sharing. Um, I hear what you're saying. Because I, I did that too before I started the podcast and started writing was I'm going to pretend like none of that happened. I am who I am today and I'm going to just focus on all the good because I've mastered this. Almost like compartmentalizing, right? Yes. So I, went, I know I went through a period of time where I almost lost who I really was because who I was back then is a piece of who I am today. That is why I am who I am. Um, yeah, I don't know if you have anything to share on that or. I agree with that. That's actually, I didn't really think much about what I wanted to say today or talk about. I just, I truly believe that what will come out will come out. And mm -hmm. that is the one thing that I did think about is that um, I kind of alluded to it before that I would never change what I went through. Mm -hmm. um, and I do believe that that fierce side of me that I tried to stuff down for so long that's actually just a part of me and that's okay and I'd rather own that and stand in it than keep trying to squash it because obviously it's a big part of who I am and for years it just came out sideways yeah and and why not stand in our power why not yeah it's like a bridge right you're standing over here and it's like the freedom's over here you know but it's like you got to cross the bridge. <laughs> yep. <laughs> it's like the same thing. We're just always growing and always, um, but over here on this side, it's like, wow, the, the, the impact you can make by being your fully true authentic self. And I'm just grateful that we're having this conversation today. So is there anything that's on your heart that you really would like to share um, with the audience that you just feels could really help someone? that may be struggling? Hmm. Mostly for me, I know in my early recovery, the, the biggest takeaway was everybody's bottom looks different. When I relapsed the first time, it was um, I had listened to a lady who had been homeless and, and she was a prostitute. And, and all I took away from that was that wasn't my life. And so I chose to go relapse because of it in my brain. I was like, I'm not that bad. I can drink and use like a normal person. Ultimately I was very wrong. Yeah. And um, what I wish I could have heard is the hope that she felt after. Mm. She talked about the emptiness and then she talked about the hope that she felt after and ultimately that's everybody in recovery that I've ever met whether they stayed clean and sober or not yeah. is the emptiness and the hope and that's really all that matters the story in between that is irrelevant really it's just about those two things well and I think that's the other piece right to sharing is that we're helping end that stigma. Because even I can get caught in my brain right now and be like, okay, when I think of an addict, what do we think? We think of somebody on the street. Mm -hmm. We think of somebody who is homeless, who is you know, wearing dirty clothes. And it's like, that is not the reality. We've sat in rooms you know, with every type of person from every type of walk of life. And mm -hmm. um, I think it's really powerful 
you know, again, I don't know, we, I keep saying this, but right, sharing our stories, sharing our experience, mm-hmm. our strength and our hope, because we need to break that stigma. I think until we break that stigma, it's going to be really difficult for people not to get caught up in the addiction um, because they have to hide in shame. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. Because that's always what I thought too. When I came out as an addict alcoholic, I grew up in a small town. And so in my mind, an alcoholic was the old man with the huge nose <laughs> sitting on the corner with a paper bag. And that is a type of alcoholic and that's a face of an alcoholic, but that wasn't my face. And my face was still just as much of an alcoholic as they were. Mm-hmm. And, um, I think that it's important, I agree, to share our stories and, and let everybody know. And the young people nowadays, um, it's how scary and alone that slope can be. And that it's okay at any point in time, no matter how young or how old you are, but really for the young generation, that it's okay to say, I don't want to do this anymore. Mm, yeah. Well, Katie, I'm just... Again, grateful that you were able to take the time today to come and chat with me. And I hope that we can do it again soon. I would like that. Okay. (laughs) Thank you for having me.